Mouse Hunts and Mouse Traps, a Shakespearean Trope for Male Sexual Predation, by Jeffrey Myers and Victoria Myers. Male sexual predation is currently a pressing concern of contemporary Western society, especially in the United States, but it has always been a concern since the beginning of Western culture. After all, both the Iliad and the Odyssey examine the problems created by male sexual predation. The former opens with Agamemnon taking the woman who has been awarded to Achilles, and the entire war begins with Paris stealing Helen from Menelaus. The latter centers upon Odysseus' attempt to return to his wife, Penelope, who is being besieged in her home by an aggressive group of suitors. Since 20 minutes is insufficient to thoroughly examine this theme, we will concentrate on one permutation, a particular trope used by Shakespeare to signify male sexual predation. Specifically, we will argue that Shakespeare signifies male sexual predation through a trope in which a mouse represents the vagina. Readers have always seen The Mouse Trap, the famous play within the play in Hamlet, as a trap for Claudius. But if we consider it tropically, as Hamlet says we should, it shows how the murderer gets the love of Gonzago's wife, or how he traps her mouse. It is clear that Hamlet is as interested in the Queen's infidelity as he is in catching the murderer of his father, and it is clear that Gertrude recognizes and objects to the nature of his concern of the mousetrap when she critiques the play by telling Hamlet, the lady doth protest too much. Shakespeare also uses the mousetrap elsewhere in the play when he tells Gertrude to let the bloat king tempt you again to bed, pinch wanton on your cheek, call you his mouse, after he has accused her of killing his father in order to marry his uncle. Shakespeare also uses the trope earlier in his career, in Romeo and Juliet, when Lady Capulet, on the night when they are staying awake to prepare for Juliet's wedding, tells her husband, who has boasted of staying awake all night when he was younger, I, you have been a mouse hunt in your time, but I will watch you from such watching now. Capulet responds, a jealous hood, a jealous hood. The joke depends on her feigning jealousy of old Capulet, now an old man incapable of hunting mice. Even in this comic moment, however, Shakespeare links male sexual predation and infidelity. Shakespeare knew the trope from two of Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. In The Miller's Tale, male sexual predation leads directly to infidelity. Chaucer describes the parish clerk Absalon's lust for the young wife of an old carpenter as follows. I dare well say, if she had been a mouse and he a cat, he would have pounced on her at once. Absalom does not know, however, that another clerk has already won Alison by catching Hera be the Quainta. Quainta was a Middle English slang term for female genitalia, and probably the source of the modern word cunt. He has literally already caught her metaphorical mouse. We know that Shakespeare was familiar with Chaucer from Troilus and Cressida and the two noble kinsmen the latter based on the tale that precedes the Millers. We even know Shakespeare used Thomas Spate's edition of Chaucer, so there can be little doubt of his familiarity with the Miller's tale. That the husband of Chaucer's Alison is an old carpenter is significant because the medieval archetype of a cuckold married to a young wife was St. Joseph, an old carpenter. As in Hamlet, where Gertrude is a victim of Claudius' predation, she is the mouse in the trap, the tale is ostensibly about female infidelity, but it is the unfaithful wife who is vulnerable to male predation. First, she is sexually vulnerable to the old carpenter, her husband, John, because of the financial disadvantage that forces her to marry him. Second, she is vulnerable to the younger men who want to trap her mouse. The trope also appears in The Manciple's Tale. Though this tale from Ovid is primarily about female infidelity, the Manciple makes it clear that men can also be unfaithful sexual predators, and uses the example of a well-cared-for cat that would abandon everything he has as soon as he spots a vulnerable mouse. This male sexual predation leads to infidelity, both male and female. The tale itself is about Phoebus, the most beautiful of the gods, and his wife. While Phoebus is away, his wife sleeps with an ordinary, lesser, man. When Phoebus' pet crow tells him this, Phoebus kills his wife. However, Phoebus immediately regrets killing her and hates himself for his actions. It seems that, in cases of female infidelity, Chaucer allows for the vulnerability of the woman. 
Hamlet complains that his mother has made a similarly poor choice in choosing Claudius over his father. In Act 3, Scene 4, when Hamlet compares the pictures of the two men, he asks how Gertrude could prefer such an, in his opinion, obviously inferior man. The ghost who claims to be Hamlet's father, however, despite knowing that Gertrude is sleeping with Claudius, does not want to make Phoebus' mistake, and tells Hamlet earlier in the play not to take any action against his mother. Taint not thy mind, nor let thy soul contrive against thy mother aught. Leave her to heaven. Shakespeare, like Chaucer, allows for the victimization of the woman even when he hints at her infidelity. Western art also provides visual examples of this mousetrap trope. In Robert Campin's Marode Altarpiece, Joseph, the ultimate cuckold in Christian mythology, is literally cuckolded while making the mousetrap that signifies his lust for the Virgin. The painting, which is at the Cloisters in New York City, makes fun of St. Joseph as the conventional old man who has foolishly married a young girl in order to satisfy his lust. The central panel appears to be a typical annunciation depicting the moment of insemination of the Virgin Mary by the Holy Spirit, here flying on a cross through a window toward his goal. We have the attendant angel and the patrons in a panel on the left. The key to the tone of the painting, however, is the panel on the other side, depicting St. Joseph making mouse traps. As the old man is preparing to capture the mouse of the young virgin, he is being cuckolded in the main panel. And the position of the virgin on the floor, which the iconographers have referred to as the position of humility, suggests a less than humble attitude. In fact, she seems rather pleased with herself. And why not? She's stunningly beautiful and reposes in a wonderful house equipped with all of the material goods that accompany affluence, including books in this pre-Gutenberg society. She's sitting on the floor, reading, perhaps from the Psalms, as Panofsky claims, but she might just as well be reading from a more secular and racy work, such as Picaccio's Decameron, which he dedicated to women who were unable, as men were, to seek entertainment outside the home. Campen also uses the wonderful folds of her garment to clearly show that her legs are spread apart, presumably ready for the insemination that is about to occur as the Holy Spirit makes a beeline for her mouse. Years ago, when my dad first took me to see the painting, I told him, if this were painted now, she'd be lounging on the floor looking into her smartphone. And, in fact, this is the first annunciation placed in such a private domestic space. In the context of mouse hunting, the two donors look like voyeurs spying on a scene of domestic intimacy in which a beautiful young angel is kneeling in supplication before a young lady in hardly the most modest of postures. And again, the young virgin is vulnerable to the sexual predation, both contemplated and realized, of two older males. While this interpretation of the painting as comedic in its references to the sexual dynamics of the scene might seem to us to attribute to Campen a satirical playfulness unexpected for the time, such an attitude was actually quite common in the art of his contemporaries. That the husband of Chaucer's Allison is an old carpenter is undeniably a reference to Joseph as the medieval archetype of an old cuckold married to a young wife. Pre-Shakespearean ballads and mystery plays often get laughs from Joseph's surprise, anger, or just sorrow when he discovers that his young wife is already pregnant. In the Cherry Tree Carol, child ballad number 54, for example, when the pregnant Mary asks her cuckolded husband, skeptical that God is the father of her child, to get her some cherries from a nearby tree, he tells her to have the father of the baby get her the cherries, at which point the tree bends down so that she can reach the fruit making Joseph look even more ridiculous. The trope of the mouse connected to male sexual predation is still linked back to Shakespeare in later art and literature. In 1830, Tennyson uses the trope in his poem about Mariana in Shakespeare's Measure for Measure. Measure is Shakespeare's Me Too play, for it involves sexual extortion in its most brutal form. Angelo, angel in Italian, a Puritan who has been put in charge of Vienna during the Duke's absence, has decided to reform the licentious city by enforcing laws against immorality that haven't been enforced for years. Of course, he manages to condemn to death the only loving and faithful couple in the whole play, when Juliet becomes pregnant before an actual marriage, because she and her fiancé, Claudio, 
were delaying an official marriage until the arrival of a dowry. When Claudia's sister, Isabella, or Beautiful Ice, a novice in a strict nunnery and as puritanical as Angelo, comes to beg for her brother's life, Angelo immediately lusts for her and subsequently tells her he will spare Claudio if she will sleep with him. When she threatens to expose him, he credibly claims that no one will believe her because of his reputation for virtue and her desperation for her brother. The Duke, however, who is still in Vienna in disguise, learns what is going on and reveals to Isabella and to us that Angelo, in fact, has a fiancée, Mariana, whom he abandoned when her brother drowned at sea while transporting her dowry. The Duke subsequently convinces Isabella to arrange to meet Angelo for a brief sexual encounter. A servant is waiting outside, in a place that is isolated and totally dark. Of course, Mariana will take Isabella's place, thus consummating her marriage with Angelo. In his poem, Tennyson chooses to emphasize Mariana's melancholy while she spends her time alone at a location called the Moated Grange, referring to a mouse who behind the moldering wainscot shrieked, or from the crevice peered about. Mariana is the aging, virginal spectator of the outside world. She only said, My life is dreary, he cometh not, she said. She said, I am a weary, a weary, I would that I were dead. Just as she is isolated, her mouse is hidden away as well. John Everett Millay, in his painting Mariana, which was first exhibited at the Royal Academy with the above lines from Tennyson as a caption, responds to the poet by depicting Mariana when she decides to participate in the bed trick on Angelo. Millay moves the mouse away from its hiding place to mid-room, thereby vulnerable to nearby cats. Not only is Millay's painting a response to Tennyson, playing with the symbolism of a revealed mouse, it also depicts two annunciations. First, there is the traditional annunciation in the stained glass window above Mariana's workspace. However, the angel in the window is not only interacting with the stained glass Virgin Mary, but also with Mariana, which creates the second annunciation. The blue dress that Mariana wears further associates her with the Virgin, though her posture is the opposite of most annunciation virgins. Instead of curling in on herself away from the angel and putting her hands in front of her chest, her stance is very open, with her hands on her waist pushing her hips forward towards the angel, like Campin emphasizing the sexuality of his virgin. The mouse in the bottom right corner is not left out of this interaction. Following the direction of the angel's benediction sign leads her eye all the way to the mouse, passing over Mariana's mouse along the way. It is significant, however, that, unlike the angel in the Merode altarpiece, the angel, not the Holy Spirit, is pointing towards Mariana's mouse, because Angelo is the Italian for angel. Just as Angelo is distracted from the Virgin Isabella by Mariana, the stained glass angel is distracted from the Virgin in the window by Mariana's mouse. Thus Malay, Tennyson, Campin, Shakespeare, and Chaucer are all in dialogue, sharing the same symbol. Reading and recognizing the symbol of the mouse allows us to share in their joke and derive deeper meaning from each of their works. In the 20th century, the trope continues. Perhaps the most obvious example is Steinbeck's Of Mice and Men, in which Lenny's destructive playing with mice is a direct metaphor for male destruction of women. As the mice die, so does the woman he caresses to death. Steinbeck also points out that a different woman earlier accused Lenny of rape. More recently, and more positively, Neil Stephenson's The Diamond Age, or A Young Lady's Illustrated Primer, shows his heroine, Nell, at the head of an all-female army of little mice, who defeat the male army engaged in rape, thereby avenging the men's sexual predation. Stephenson acknowledges the Western cultural trope and flips it to tell a tale of female empowerment. But that is a subject for another day.